Hello again. Welcome to the Learning Management System Initiative by Department of Collegiate and Technical Education. So in session 12, that is today's session, we're going to try and answer different MCQs about topics that we have already dealt with in the previous session. Um, so let's start off. So in session 9 of Unit 2 of Green Computing, we were talking about energy saving software techniques. We were talking about how green computing consists of both hardware as well as software. And it is not only hardware that results in environmental hazards because of the e-waste that is generated, but also the kind of software we use can lead to a lot of energy wastage and can decrease energy efficiency and increase power consumption. So while designing application programs, there are certain techniques that we can adopt in programming that is going to save energy and reduce power consumption. In session 9, we were talking about data efficiency as one of the methods for achieving energy efficiency. In data efficiency, we learned about two methods to achieve data efficiency. One was effectively managing the disk input and output operations. Now, the second method to achieve data efficiency was through the method of prefetching and caching. Moving on, when we spoke about managing the disk input and opera, uh, output operations, we discussed uh, about how a hard disk actually works. We discussed about the characteristics of the hard disk, such as uh, rotational time, rotational latency, seek time, and the transfer rate. We also saw that there were five experiments uh, that gave us an idea about how to manage data so that the number of accesses to and from the hard disk is at a minimal number. So experiment one dealt with the impact of the block size. That is, if you're reading a really huge file in a sequential, um, if you're reading a sequential data file, which is really huge, say 1 GB, then breaking down that file into uh, 8 KB or more sized blocks can result in lower processor utilization and can result in the uh, power consumption being less. Uh, the next experiment dealt with the impact of NCQ, native command queuing. The experiment three dealt with the effect of buffering, adopting a buffering strategy during multimedia playback, whether you're going to uh, be watching audio or video. If your application uses a buffering strategy, then it results in energy efficiency. Experimental uh, Experiment four dealt with the impact of fragmentation, where we learned about how fragmented files and unfragmented files uh, help in either increasing energy efficiency or decreasing energy efficiency. And in experiment five, we learned about multi-threaded code where a single process was divided into threads which were capable of executing simultaneously and independently. So as we discuss the MCQs on this session, we'll also try and recap whatever we learned in the previous session. So moving on, the first MCQ on session 9, data efficiency reduces energy costs by data movements, maximizing, minimizing, stopping or controlling. Now, what is data efficiency? If you want to achieve data efficiency, it means you need to have minimal data movements. What is minimal data movements? You need to minimize the accesses to the hard disk drive. Your data and instructions is stored on the hard disk, which is the main memory. And every time you want to run a process, you need to bring that data and memory from the hard disk into your CPU. And once the CPU finishes executing the process, it has to put the results of the output back in the hard disk. Now, this movement between the main memory and the CPU, the number of times this movement takes place needs to be minimized. So, data efficiency reduces any co energy cost by minimizing data movements. That is the right answer. If you're going to maximize data movements, then it results in higher energy costs. You can't stop data movements, neither can you control the data movements because all data movements are application dependent. All you can do is 
um, prepare application programs in such a way which minimizes the data movement. Now, uh, the second question is RPM. RPM is a unit of measuring rotational speed of a hard disk drive. When we were talking about the hard disk drive, we saw that uh, we dealt with four characteristics of the hard disk drive that can increase the performance of the hard disk drive. The first one was rotational speed and the unit to measure this rotational speed is RPM which stands for revolutions per minute. Now higher the RPM of a hard disk, greater is the transfer rate of data which means in a single cycle a huge amount of data can basically be transferred. Um, so, RPM stands for revolutions per minute. The answer is D. Um, next, moving on. Which activity consumes most hard disk drive power? When we were dealing with this topic, we actually saw a simple bar chart where there were three activities of the hard disk. Idle, read and write and disk spin up and energy was measured in the Y axis. So, in the idle state, the CPU is in the idle state, which means it is not executing any process actively. So, uh, that state is not going to consume the most amount of power. The read and the write state is going to consume most amount of power, but it is the final option D, which will going to consume the most amount of power bit because it involves the mechanical disk spin up in order to move the data from the hard disk drive to the processor. Uh, question number four. What is the recommend block size on sequential reads for improved performance? Now, this question is related to experiment one of uh, data efficiency, managing disk input and output operations. So, in that experiment, we saw that whenever your application reads a really huge file in a sequential manner, the energy consumption is more. But it also, but we also saw that when this file was broken down into sizes, into different sizes and read, and the power that was consumed was actually measured, the most effective uh, was block size of 8 KB or greater. So the option is C. So when this 1 GB file was broken into 8 KB blocks or more, then uh, power consumption was seen that was minimum and energy efficiency was maximum. The fifth question is NCQ. NCQ is uh, option B. It stands for Native Command Queuing. It is a technology which allows the hard disk to determine in which, opera, in which order the read and the write operations have to take place. So you leave the entire decision making of how, in which order the read and the write has to take place to the hard disk. That is what NCQ stands for. So if you have random uh, I.O. operations in your applications, then you need to make use of NCQ in order to increase the energy efficiency. Now, the sixth question is, which of the following methodology will save energy in multimedia playback? Um, this corresponds to experiment three on managing disk input and output. It was seen that whenever you have multimedia playback like audio and video, it was seen that the buffering strategy is what helps to conserve energy. So reading two KB blocks, reading eight KB blocks, sequential read or buffering strategy. So buffering is about reading ahead the data and storing it into a faster memory, thereby reducing power consumption. So the CPU doesn't uh, have to go all the way through the main memory to fetch the instructions and data. You read ahead and put everything in a buffer so that it is ready for streaming or watching. So the methodology which will save uh, energy in multimedia playback is the buffering strategy. Next, the seventh question is the seek time. Uh, the seek time is the time that is taken by um, your uh, it is the time that is uh, taken by your hard disk to locate for a specific data on the hard disk. Now, seek time is usually measured in milliseconds. Microseconds, nanoseconds or seconds is not the answer, is the answer. The seek time is measured in milliseconds. It is the amount of time that is required to look for a specific data 
on your hard disk drive. Um, the eighth question, dash energy is uh, energy cost is required to read a fragmented file when compared to a contiguous file. Now, you already know that fragmented files are files in which it is divided into bits and pieces and scattered all across your hard disk. So it definitely takes up more energy or more power to read the fragmented files rather than unfragmented files. Unfragmented files are those which are stored in contiguous memory locations in your hard disk. So lesser energy cost is required to read a fragmented file is the wrong answer. Similar is also the wrong answer. Greater energy cost is required to read a fragmented file when compared to a contiguous file. So C is the answer. So if your application is making use of fragmented files, then it is the best practice to first defragment it and then if it is read by your application, it results in lower processor utilization and greater energy efficiency. So these are the questions about uh, data efficiency. These are the answers that you can probably see while you are trying to solve. In the session 10 of green computing, we were um, talking about prefetching and caching. Prefetching and caching is about moving your data and instructions from a slower memory, which is your main memory, into a faster memory, which is your cache memory. You do this to effectively reduce the access time, uh, lower the CPU utilization and increase energy efficiency. Um, when we were dealing with prefetching and caching, we saw the experiment about how three DVD applications were used to play a standard DVD movie and measured the power that, were, that was consumed by these applications in the no save mode and the power saving mode. We saw that those DVD applications which adopted the strategy of buffering minimized DVD drive use and letting the OS manage the CPU frequency resulted in greater efficiency of over 40% energy was saved. Uh, in session 10, we also spoke about context awareness. In context awareness, we took two examples to give us an idea of how applications can make use of context awareness in order to save power and extend the battery life of the user's device. Okay, so let's move on. As in when we discuss the MCQs, we'll try and recap session 10. So the first question is, consider the following statements about cache pre-fetching. First one is, fetching instructions or data from slower memory to faster memory. Second, the source for prefetch is usually the main memory. Accessing cache memory is much faster than accessing the main memory. Stream buffering is the most common prefetching technique. Now, um, we need to deduce as to uh, which of the above statements are true or correct. So, cache prefetching uh, is fetching instructions or data from a slower memory, which is your main memory, to a faster memory, which is your cache memory. So, that uh, uh, the first one is correct. The source for prefetch is usually the main memory. So, the main memory is the memory that has all your instructions and data. So, the source is the main memory. The second point is correct. Accessing cache memory is definitely much faster than main memory because your cache memory is made up of faster registers. So, accessing cache memory is much faster. The fourth one is stream buffering is the most common prefetching technique. Definitely, if you're going to use audio or uh, video playback, then stream buffering is a prefetching technique. So, the answer is B. All the four statements, one, two, three, and four are correct. The second question, prefetching and caching can save energy during DVD playback. Uh, so we saw the DVD um, experiments. So definitely true. It can uh, save energy during DVD playback. Cannot be determined. You could see that it definitely can be determined because we took three DVD applications and measured the power consumption. False is the wrong answer. It is application dependent is again the wrong answer. So the correct answer to question number two is A. Which of the below guidelines helps save energy during the DVD playback? Um, 
The first one is buffering. Second one is operating system managing the CPU frequency. Third one is maximizing the DVD drive use. And the fourth one is minimizing the DVD drive use. We saw that um, uh, uh, when we were talking about prefetching and caching, there were three guidelines that emerged. The first guideline was buffering. Buffering the data helps save energy. So one is correct. The second is minimizing the DVD drive use. You need to reduce the number of accesses to the DVD drive use. If you're going to maximize it, more power is consumed. And the third uh, recommendation that came was uh, operating system managing the CPU frequency, where the operating system decides where that uh, decides the P states in which the CPU has to operate. You know that the CPU has C states and P states. In the P states, the CPU is executing instructions at different frequency. So that decision in which frequency what instructions are to be executed is should be left to the operating system. So the answer to this is one is correct. 2 is correct and 4 is correct. So the answer to this question is D. The fourth one, the objective of context awareness. Now what is context awareness? It is to create applications that are able to sense the outside environment and react to it or be able to respond to it. So whenever you think of context awareness, think about the light sensors in your device that dims your device in dark mode and uh, which, uh, sorry, uh, yes, which dims your device in the dark mode and brightens the uh, screen light in a broad daylight. So the first one, the objective is to create applications that respond and adapt to the environmental changes. So the answer is A. Create applications that imitate outside environment. No, that is usually called as simulation. Create simulated software applications. No, create applications that do not sense the external and environment. So this is an easy question. So the option is A. Which of the following are context aware behaviors? Smartphone warning you when the battery is low. So that application is able to... Um, is able to uh, perceive whether your battery is low or not. That is definitely context aware behavior. The second one is handheld device writing the data to flash memory when the battery is low. So if your mobile uh, battery or device battery is running low and is going to be turned off any moment in order to save the last uh, bit of information or whatever is the current state, uh, writing data to flash memory is definitely a context aware behavior. Switching to night mode in smartphones, yes, automatic, it can be a configurable, a configurable option or it could be a passive response or it can be a active response. That is again a context aware behavior. Differentiating between Wi-Fi and cellular network while downloading multimedia. We all have WhatsApp on our phones. WhatsApp gives us a configurable option uh, to download data and videos. Uh, if we are connected to the Wi-Fi and cellular network or only Wi-Fi or if we have to manually download data. So all these four are context aware behaviors. So the answer is one, two, three and four. Now the sixth one. GUID in Microsoft implementation stands for. Now um, it stands for C, Globally Unique Identifier, but it is more important for us to understand what these Globally Unique Identifiers are used for. When we were talking about context awareness, we spoke about awareness of the power source. Does it benefit for the applications that are running on your phone to know whether you're connected to the DC power source or the AC. AC is a continuous power source that is when you plug in your laptop or your mobile phone into a charging point. DC is when you're operating on battery. So how does this application know whether you're connected to AC or DC? This is possible because the operating system provides you with these globally unique identifiers that you can query to know whether the device is connected to AC or DC. So the answer for the sixth question is C. It stands for globally unique identifier. You have several globally unique identifiers that you can query. 
The seventh question is which GUID is queried to check if the power source is AC or DC. It is uh, GUID underscore AC DC underscore power underscore source. Okay, so the answer to the uh, to this one is A. Now, when you query this particular GUID, it gives you a response as to whether where your application can determine whether your device, your laptop, or your phone is connected to the DC or the AC, and then can effectively um, decide what to do next. For example, uh, if you have a software download. Now, and you're running low on battery. We took this example in the previous session as well. So, um, do you want that application to start installation and downloading the software update? No. How does the application know that you're running low on battery, that you're on DC? It is by querying this particular globally unique identifier. Now, the next one, eighth question. Consider the following statements about context awareness. Context awareness can be used to adapt an application's behavior to the external environment. Yes, you move into broad daylight, uh, the brightness increases. You move into a dark room, the brightness decreases. Yes, adapt an application in response to external environment. The first point is correct. It can extend the battery life of the user. Yes, definitely when it is not necessary, context aware behavior can definitely help us in saving power and increasing the energy efficiency. Context awareness requires sensors. Yes, when we spoke about sensors, we spoke about different kinds of sensors that our uh, devices have, like the accelerometer, like the gyro sensor, light sensor, the GPS receiver. So we spoke about those. Con context awareness behavior is made possible only if you're going to use sensors in your device. Embedded systems are particularly not context aware. The fourth point is wrong. Embedded systems are dedicated systems which have a microcontroller or a microprocessor and do a specific dedicated function. So when we spoke about embedded systems, we uh, spoke about embedded systems in automobiles like uh, the cruise control um, uh, the seat belt sign coming on if uh, the driver is not wearing a seat belt, well, the airbags, all these are embedded systems and embedded systems are particularly context aware and they also depend on sensors. So the fourth point is wrong. So the answer to this is C, which is one, two and three only. So these are the answers to the session 10 MCQs. Now, in our last session that we did, we were talking about idle efficiency. The word idle means that the CPU is not being used by any process. Okay, uh, so it has actually finished executing all the active workloads and currently is in a sleep mode. And uh, by increasing the time that the CPU is in this idle mode, we actually can increase the energy efficiency because the CPU is doing nothing. So power is going to be consumed. And the ways in which the idle efficiency can be increased is deep sea state residency, OS timer resolution and background activity. We need to keep the CPU in the idle mode for as long as possible. So in your system, you have what are called as the sea states. The C state is a low power idle state of the CPU and there are different degrees of C states like C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5 and it goes on and varies for different operating systems. So the higher the number of the C state, it means that the processor is in a deeper sleep mode. So the processor has to be in the highest uh, C mode for us to save maximum power and for us to increase the energy efficiency. That is about the deep C state residency. The second one is OS timer resolution. We were talking about how the timer resolution of Windows is 15.6 milliseconds, but certain applications like graphics and animations require the resolution to be much higher. So they try and change the resolution to one milliseconds. And when that happens, the battery life decreases. It has a negative impact on the device battery life. We were talking about background activity, how background activities can increase the power consumption of a device. 
Uh, also, last session we were talking about uh, how applications can make use of certain hardware tools and software tools uh, to see their impact on the hardware units of a system. The system is made up of different hardware units like the monitor, the hard disk drive, the RAM, um, uh, the motherboard, the sound card, um, and all these. So, these applications can actually measure. Uh, what is the power consumption on these different hardware units when these applications are basically run on the device. So the hardware tool that we were talking about was Fluke Net DAQ, Fluke Networked Data Acquisition Tool. And we discussed about three software tools, Power CFT Power Configuration, which was a Windows tool, and Power Informer and Energy Checker, which was basically tools by Intel. So now let's uh, discuss a few MCQs. Consider the following statements about idle power. It is the power consumed when a system is running but not actively executing processes. Now this statement is correct. Idle power means the CPU is running. Some basic uh, functions are running but it is not actively executing any process. There is maximum background activity during idle power. You need to ensure that idle power, you need to have minimum background activity. Background activity such as an antivirus scan uh, that you have scheduled or um, some kind of disk fragmentation, some kind of scheduling. Okay, you need to ensure that these background activities are minimal during idle power and definitely not ma maximum. So the second point is wrong. Increase in idle efficiency increases battery life. Definitely, if you try and put the processor in a deep sleep mode, it is going to increase energy efficiency, which increases your battery life. That is true. Increase in idle efficiency decreases battery life. The fourth point is wrong. So the answer to this is the first is correct and the third one is correct. So the answer to this is C. Now, what is C state residency? I told you the processor works in two states, C state and the P state. C state is a low power mode that the CPU enters when it is idle, when it is not executing any active process. So the answer to this question is B. It is definitely not a high power mode. It is a low power mode. And in this mode, it is not actively executing any process. So the answer is B. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to the third one. To reduce C state transitions in applications, it is recommended to split tasks between threads that execute in parallel, split tasks between threads that do not execute in parallel, to not split a task between threads, to use only single threads. Now, if you're going to use any single threads, it's not going to result in data efficiency or result in power being saved. So you have to use the concept of multi-threading. But in order to reduce the C-state transitions, you need to multi-thread in such a way that the processes can actually execute independently. Okay, there shouldn't be any inter-process uh, communication which actually raises an interrupt. Now, what is the C-state transition? The processor being active and the processor being in a idle mode. You cannot uh, keep getting the processor out of the idle mode to execute a process and push it back into the idle mode. This is going to consume a lot of energy. So such kind of transitions from C state to active mode, from active mode to C state, such transitions need to be minimized. So A is the right answer. You need to split tasks and ensure that these threads execute in parallel without inter-process communication. Now, UBPM, in order to achieve idle efficiency, we discussed that the background activities need to be kept at a minimal and Windows operating system provides uh, what is called as UBPM, which is Unified Background Process Manager, which ensures that the power consumed by the background process is maintained and is kept to a minimum. So what does this do? It minimizes the power consumption from background activities only, not from foreground. So B and D are wrong. It does not have anything to do with the foreground activities. It does not maximize power consumption. It only minimizes the power consumption from background activities to ensure that the idle efficiency is at the highest. 
Next is about uh, following statements about background processes. Background activities such as antivirus can, can prevent the system from going into an idle state. The unified background process manager has been introduced to minimize power consumption from background activities. That point is true. UPPM enables trigger start services based on environmental changes. Yes, true. Fourth one is frequent periodic background activity increases the system power consumption. All the four statements are true. The background activities can prevent the CPU from going into an idle mode. And uh, UBPM enables trigger start services. So there is a trigger and only when it is going to start the services. To understand this point, we actually took the example of Bluetooth. So your Bluetooth services are turned on only when you have another Bluetooth device that you need to connect your device with. So the trigger is a Bluetooth device wanting to connect or a Bluetooth radio wanting to play and start services is only then the Bluetooth service is actually started on your device. So the answer to the fifth one is D, one, two, three and four. Now coming to the sixth one, which of the following are software tools that measure energy efficiency of applications. So we discussed about both hardware tools as well as software tools. So power configuration is a software tool. Energy checker is a software tool. The fluke networked data acquisition is a hardware tool and power informer is again a software tool. So the answer to this is one, three and sorry, one, two and four, which is D. Consider the following statements about Fluke Networked DAQ. It is a hardware tool that is used to measure the platform power consumption while running different applications on the system. That is correct. When you um, use the Fluke Net DAQ, it's a hardware tool. You have a special motherboard that is connected to your host PC. The special motherboard is built in, has a built in sense resistors. Okay, and uh, these sense resistors measure the current that passes through them in the voltage drop when these applications are run on the host PC and then everything, all the data, the voltages are measured and the average that power that is consumed by each of these hardware units while different applications are run on the system is measured. So, all the four points about the fluke net DAQ are correct. A are 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, the answer to the seventh one is D. 1, 2, 3, and 4. The next is about power configuration. It is a software tool. Yes, it is a software tool by Windows, which is again Microsoft. The first statement is correct. It is a command line tool, so you can use it in your command line. And it tells you about all the system's power management settings. Uh, that is true. The third point is the power configuration shows overall processor utilization and per process uh, processor utilization. Uh, that is also true. It provides an HTML report based on a snapshot of the system's energy consumption over a 50 second period. Now this is false. The power configuration provides a HTML report on a snapshot of the system's energy consumption not over 50 seconds but 60 seconds period. So answer is 1, 2 and 3. So the option is D. Next, the following statements about Power Informer. Power Informer is a tool. It is a software tool developed by Intel to provide power relevant statistics to a developer. So it helps the developer to develop more energy efficient applications. First one is correct. It does not include battery and power status indicators. It definitely includes the battery and the power status indicators. Second point is wrong. It provides the interrupt rate of the system. That is correct. Number of times the system interrupt is actually thrown. It gives you that rate. It is correct. It does not provide disk input output operation rates. It provides both disk input output operation rates as well as file input and output and read operation rates. So the fourth one is wrong and the second one is wrong. The answer to this is one and three. The last one, consider the following statements about the energy checker software tool. It is a software tool. It was developed by Intel. Yes, it helps to write energy aware software. Now, what is energy aware software? Your software is capable of measuring 
the power consumed when that particular software is running and also reports the power consumed dynamically. This is what is meant by energy aware software and energy checker helps to write such kind of software. So the second point is true. It provides the concept of counters with three functions, open, read and write a counter. It actually provides the concept of counters with five functions, open, uh, read, write, close and to reopen a counter. So the third one is false. Activity is measured by how busy a server is when running an application rather than useful work performed by an application. Because when you take two applications, one can be a database application, one can be a mail server application or a video playback application. Now you cannot measure the useful work of these three applications because they're all performing different tasks. So how does energy checker work? It works by looking at uh, the activities of these applications and seeing how busy they keep the server rather than the useful work done by these applications. Um, so only the third point is wrong. So the uh, answer to this question is D, 1, 2 and 4. Um, so these are the answers to the session 11 MCQs. Thank you for listening in uh, to this session. I hope uh, all these sessions uh, help you to learn better. Thank you.